we go to the Diamond Factory Hotline where I welcome in social media maven, Duke Blue Devil fan. I can't believe I have to say that part. And more importantly, the Athletics beat writer for the Dallas Cowboys. He is my man, John Machota. John, what's going on? Not much, man. You should check check those social media accounts. I don't think I'm the only Duke Blue Devil fan out there. They got, they got quite a following. <laughs> well, you're the only one that I know. Actually, you're one of like maybe three that I know. There's another one that I know. His name is Kevin Hagelin, of course, works for 105 Through the Fan. And I think that's about it. Like, meeting Duke fans like on purpose is a rarity uh, for me these days. I don't know how. Well, you know Micah Parsons. That's right. <laughs> See, Micah, okay, we'll, we'll get into Micah for sure, because, yes, Micah <laughs> declared himself a Duke Blue Devil fan, among other uh, fans of players and teams today uh, as part of his conversation. So we'll get into that throughout the course of our, our time together. But uh, appreciate you joining me here tonight. Obviously, the Cowboys continue their preparations for the 2023 uh, NFL season. In fact, John, let's just start with Micah, because I'm not going to lie to you. I had a ball today listening to Micah, because – it feels like the young man is extremely comfortable going into year three with who he is as a person, what he represents on this team, and how much he wants to continue to chase greatness. What were your takeaways from Micah and what he had to say today? Well, I mean, first, he's always great for our business because he's very rarely not entertaining. I mean, you can tell like he puts in an effort to try and, and be entertaining. That's why, you know, when his football career is done – I think most of us expect him to be on TV, radio, you know, podcasting, doing whatever, because uh, he has a lot of thoughts about a lot of different things, and, and he enjoys sharing them. So anytime he talks, that's always fascinating. But then it's also the fact that he's, you know, he's a game wrecker. I mean, he's the most talented player on the Dallas Cowboys team, and he might be the best defensive player in all of football. And when you have that, you know, it, it, it's hard not to pay attention to that person, even if, let's say, they weren't a good quote. I mean, it, but he does, he encompasses all of it. And so, I mean, heck, I don't know. I think we talked in probably about 15 minutes. I, mm -hmm. The one that the, – the, the answer to me that stood out the most, and, and a lot of it was really good, but the one that stood out the most was when he was asked towards the end about if he wants to lead the league in sacks. And he, and he talked about – I mean, right off the bat, brought up Aaron Donald, how, you know, Aaron Donald doesn't necessarily lead the league in sacks every year, but he is just – you, he affects everything that goes on on that defense because everything that he does has to be accounted for because just one, you know, miss on him and he can just wreck the entire game. And, and Micah's that type of a player. He's talented like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's not Aaron Donald yet, but he has the potential to be that type of a player. And it's interesting to just hear him talk about how, like, well, that's what he wants to be. He wants to be a guy that can impact the entire game, not just, well, hey, at the end, what did you have? Oh, I had two sacks today, or I finished with 20 this season, and I and I led the league or whatnot. It's let me make an overall impact for the rest of the defense. And, and you know what, to be honest with you, that might not have as much of an impact if he's on a, on a bad team. And let's say there's a lot of weak spots on the defense. But because there's so many strengths on this defense, if if that opposing offense has to spend, you know, even just an extra guy, you know, another guy looking over there, that can just open so much more up for this defense, which I, I think will be the strength of this team. Yeah, Micah seems like a guy that he understands what his role is and what he's going to be needing to do. And the awareness of just wanting to affect the game and more importantly, help his teammates be able to affect the game. I think that continues to show his maturity as a player, which I think for Dan Quinn and the overall football team is going to be massive for them. Obviously, for this defense, he talked about, you know, Sam Williams as well, wanted to help him continue to get better. Is this defense going to be the reason why the Cowboys are successful in the 2023 NFL season? Yeah, I think they will be. I think it's going to be one of the top two or three and has the potential to be the best defense in the NFL. And because of that alone, I think they'll win a lot of games just on that. But ultimately, when we get to January – that'll be a huge part of it. Don't get me wrong, but there's going to be moments where the offense is going to have to step up. You know, it, most of these games come down to big moments late. And so that's the thing is what's nice about it is that, yes, you're going to a new play caller, you know, you're bringing in Brandon cooks. There's obviously some changes when you don't have Ezekiel Elliott and, you know, Dalton Schultz, there's, you know, some musical chairs going on right now on the offensive line because of how good the defense is and the continuity they have over there, having Dan Quinn back again, that should buy them a decent amount of time to try and get that offense where it needs to be. So when you are in January, you should be clicking. And, and I believe that that will happen. I believe the only way, 
You know, I, I, for me, it's not about, oh, do they have enough at wide receiver or do you trust, you know, that Mike McCarthy is going to be an outstanding play caller? I think all that stuff irons itself out with this team as long as that you have the pieces out there. Now, if you have a bunch of injuries, it, it's just constantly a new offensive line up front. Wide receivers are in and out. Uh, you know, Tony Pollard's not, you know, giving you the full uh, workload because he's got to come out of games and things like that. I can see that causing problems. But if they can stay relatively healthy on offense, I think everything will take care of itself. Speaking of that offense, John, I tended to focus my attention today at practice on the wide receiver group. And I'm kind of glad that I did because I thought – Michael Gallup looked fantastic today. The The word springy comes to mind when watching Gallup today. How important is his success and more important and his health going to be for this team this upcoming year, given the fact that CeeDee Lamb and Brandon Cooks are there? And it feels like Michael Gallup is getting close or it appears back to his um, pre-torn ACL self. It's going to be huge because of just the way he plays the game. It's kind of a – it's kind of a nice compliment to the other two in, in Cooks and Lamb and that, you know, you can, like when I was watching today, you know, he's mostly on the outside and, you know, Cooks or, or Lamb are in motion. A lot of times they're trying to get, you know, Lamb singled up on one side, but, you know, those two guys are more going to be able to switch on and, and, and play a little bit more in the slot. Mike McCarthy believes that Michael Gallup can be successful in the slot and he'll see some, you know, just in the West Coast offense, he'll see some time there, but, most of his reps, I believe, will come on the outside. And, and if he if he's all the way back to what he was before the injury and he's comfortable and, and, and everything looks as good as it has and, and, every, and everyone continues to talk as highly about him as, as they have the last few weeks we've been around the team, uh, then, yeah, then everything should, should be great for Michael Gallup and, and particularly in the red zone, you know, you, you know being a guy that, uh, I, I mean, Dak's obviously comfortable with him. They've played a lot together, so – that will be a huge part for this offense. They really do need that because I do think there's a, there's quite a bit of a drop off after that first three. You know, those three have been with the running with the ones these last two weeks when we've been out there, and then that next group is Tolbert and Turpin and Simi Fajoko. and and yeah, there's an opportunity for one or two of those guys to step up, but there's just so much unknown in that second group that you really need that first group to be as healthy as possible. Let's stick there. Do you feel like Jalen Tolbert? who, as we've heard, are making improvements. C.D. Lamb talking about the improvements that Jalen Tolbert you know, is making so far this offseason. Do you see him as a realistic threat to be able to take over that number four wide receiver position? Well, I do because I do think the talent is there. You know, and, and, I, and I do understand how there could potentially be, coming from a smaller school, a little bit of an acclimation period and then things start coming at you fast and all of a sudden, you know, I, I talked to him today for a little bit and – you know, he mentioned about how he's just, you know, reacting and he's quicker off the ball and he's able to use his speed, which is, you know, one of his greatest strengths because he's not thinking as much and, and not worrying about, you know, messing up and accidentally doing the, the wrong thing. And then all of a sudden, it's not only you worrying about yourself, you're now you're worried about, like, what the coaches are saying. Am I going to not get to play next week? You know, why am I not dressing and things like that? And you're worrying about all this other stuff that, you know, really is just only slowing you down. And so... It, it, you know, when he came into camp last year or like OTAs last year at this time, he was dealing with a little bit of a leg issue, and I think that might have set him back as well. So, um, you know, he's saying all the right things. Everybody I've talked to has said, you know, he's handled this offseason the right way. And, you know, I'm a big action speak louder than words, and I, and I do feel like if they didn't think he'd be there um, or they had questions about him that they would be possibly looking to add another wide receiver, and, and I just don't get the sense that they're that they're interested in doing that right now. John Machota, the athletic covering the Dallas Cowboys, joining me here on the Get Right with Reggie KG on 105.3 The Fan. Mike McCarthy going into year four of a five-year contract. I don't know, John. I feel like the the feeling that I'm getting around this team, while there is yes, a sense of urgency to win and build upon the last couple of years and get into the playoffs, getting to the divisional round you know, this past year, that these guys feel fairly comfortable. I haven't seen, obviously, Michael Parsons. Seems like he's feeling good about himself. CeeDee Lamb, not distracted by anything going on with his contract. But for Mike McCarthy, this is an important year for him, but he seems much more comfortable in who he is as a coach and how he has to operate here with Dallas. How would you say, what would you say to that? Yeah, I think he's just, he's going to be, and he has been a lot busier just because he's in all these offensive meetings that he wasn't in all of those in, in the past. I mean, he's big on, I remember first year he was here. I remember him always saying about, you know, if you're going to be the offensive play play caller, you know, you call it, then you're going to have to install it. And so that was always the, 
reason why he would, you know, when something wouldn't be working with the offense, people would look towards McCarthy like, well, why aren't you stepping in and, and having Kellen do this and do that? Well, it's like, well, he's the one that's in all these meetings. This is his offense. This isn't, he's not just like some, you know, young protege. Like I'm going to give him, you know, tips and, and suggestions here and there, but he's the offensive coordinator. He's installing this offense. He's going to be the one in charge of it. And so now Mike McCarthy is in that seat. So it, it is going to open him up for more criticism because if the, if the offense struggles, if the offense looks um, like they're lost, that's going to reflect more on the head coach than it would have the previous three years. And so that offense, I'm not saying it has to be, you know, the number one offense in the league or even top five, but it has to look like a good solid offense that's taking care of the ball, not turning it over and winning ball games. And they've done that the last two years. It's ultimately just come down to January, but if it looks like a disaster, then yeah, it's going to look really bad on him. Um, but I don't get the sense that that's going to happen. I mean, this isn't like this is the first time he's calling plays and it's not like he only did it for a couple of years in green Bay. So um, you know, I think there'll be some adjustments in, in language and things like that. And there might be some hiccups early in the season, but ultimately I, I don't see any reason why Mike McCarthy won't do a good job as offensive play caller. Speaking of that offense, Tony Pollard talked for the first time, I believe since the playoff game where he injured his leg and was not able to complete that game, him talking about his role as the number one back on this team. What were your takeaways from him today as he assumes that number one position in that running back room and what that means for him playing on the franchise tag going into this upcoming season. Yeah, he, you could tell he didn't really care too much to talk about the franchise tag and the contract mm-hmm. thing. And, and I totally, I totally get that. I mean, everybody's different with that stuff. You know, there's, you know, there's a lot of guys that they would just rather leave that up to their agent and, and stay out of it and just go about the business of like, Hey, if I take care of my myself and do what I need to do on the field, I'm with the Dallas Cowboys. I'm going to make a lot of money. And and I think that's the right way to go about it. And I think this team has a lot of key guys that, that feel that way, and Tony being one of them. And he pretty much made that known today. But but like you said, that's the first time getting to talk to him since that injury. So that was the biggest thing to me was to hear what he had to say about where he's at. And, you know, you can watch these OTAs, and, and, and you can see him, let's say, like on some social media videos, and be like, you know what, he looks like he's – yeah, he looks like he's moving pretty well. But to hear him talk about how basically the only reason he's not out there all the time right now is because they're just being – cautious because there's no reason for him to be out there all the time. And I imagine the same thing will happen when we get out to Oxnard where, you know, he'll be out there, um, but he won't be getting the this like full workload where he's just getting exhausted with it. And I don't see him doing anything in the preseason. And so between now and week one in September, I, I think that I think he'll be fine. There'll be plenty of time for him to get right. Um, but we'll see, you know, I mean, that's, that's the big thing is that there's going to be even more workload on him. And, and so my big thing with Tony Pollard is, I'm interested to see how much his workload increases during the regular season because, let's be honest, this team is built to, to win in January. And so how much wear and tear do you want to be putting on Tony Pollard now when you're going to need him more than ever in January? And you saw what it looked like when they didn't have him in January. Mm-hmm. It was uh, tough sledding without him as the running back for this team. Uh, John, as always, my man, I appreciate the time. you got to pick for the NBA Finals. Who are you picking? The Miami Heat or the Denver Nuggets to win the Finals? I'll honestly be surprised if the Heat win two games. Like so, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking. I, I'm serious. Like I think, I think it could be the potential Nugget sweep. But uh, I'll give I'll give the Heat one. I just I'm a big believer in the cream rises to the top. Uh, I, I always believe that with the NCAA tournament. You know the, uh, the you know the first second round. There can even heck even this year there are a bunch of teams that got to the final four. But it ultimately, you know. Just Cinderella doesn't actually win it all. I mean, it came close in 2010. Gordon Hayward almost did it from half court, but usually the cream rises to the top in the very end. I remember, I remember very well in '99 when the Knicks made it as an eight seed, and then they played the Spurs, and they're just, you know, the cream rises to the top. I think that's what's going to happen here. Uh, great run from the Heat. I mean, that's amazing for them to make it, but I just think Jokic, and Murray. I mean, the whole crew. The way that that team is, that Denver team is really good. So yeah, I think they win in five games. Yeah, I say respectfully, I'll pick the Nuggets in five uh, just because I believe the Miami Heat. Respectfully. Uh, respectfully, exactly. Respectfully in five. <laughs> you can find him on Twitter at John Mashota covering the Dallas Cowboys for the Athletic. He is John Mashota. John, I appreciate the time, my man. Thank you. Anytime, man. Good talking to you.